episode 51. And she fell back in love with her chemical engineering. She felt totally in place there and could see where we can marry his agricultural background with her chemical engineering to come up with Jeff Decreed. This episode is sponsored by Aura Organic. Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of the Global Just Forking Around podcast, where I showcase a rotating cast of guests, all pivotal players from the beautifully insane, sexy world of food and beverage. I am your host, Debbie Salzberg, and welcome. Thank you all for joining. And I have some really cool stuff to tell you about as we celebrate this 50 episode milestone week or two (laughs) here at the JFA podcast. So we're really excited. Um, We've launched on social media platforms, my Instagram account at Forking Podcast, and also on my Facebook personal page, Debbie dot Salzburg, D-E-B-I, that is. It's a collage of videos that are so forking awesome. Uh, They're from uh, just forking around podcast guests and some other people you may recognize. Uh, They congratulate the podcast for the 50 episode marker, but they also include their secret sneaky treats. Uh, For example, Nicole Jolly from True Food TV reveals what her sneaky, sneaky treat is. Uh, Fudiamo guys, Raffaele, Raffaele and Roberto. They're Italian. <laughs> They're awesome to watch. They're fun to listen to. So definitely check that out. And then Lisa Ta here, she is hilarious. She ha- is from All Things Therapy and her video she recorded over Mardi Gras. So you can imagine. So definitely it's hilarious. You got to check it out on uh, at Forking Podcast or on my Facebook page, Debbie, D-E-B-I dot Salzburg. Uh, so pod ep 51. We've crossed the milestone, everybody. We're now the next goal is 100. 100 pod apps, baby. (laughs) So I'm excited because this week we are about to take you on a four-week journey around the country showcasing interviews with female distillers and women-owned distilleries. Bam! So psyched for you guys to hear all this. So cool. So this first episode is with Joyce and Autumn Nethery of Jephtha Creed. Now, Jephtha Creed, it's located in Kentucky, Shelby County to be exact, It's an incredible distillery. I mean, huge. Sits on 64 acres. It's 15,000 square feet, the actual distillery. Um, Now, just a little heads up, because of the remoteness of this distillery, the internet connection, when we recorded, it was kind of fading in and out a bit. So I apologize in advance for some of the pauses or clips that you may experience a little um, blip in. It's it's not going to ruin your listening time or the content. I just wanted to give you a little heads up that the connection kind of fell in and out a little bit and we patched it together um, on the backside. So thank you in advance for understanding. (laughs) So back to Jephtha Creed. This distillery broke ground in, I think, 2015. And again, it's a mother-daughter duo. Joyce, she has two degrees in chemical engineering. Daughter, Autumn, went to Scotland to learn firsthand the process of distillation at the coveted Harriet Watt University in Edinburgh, Scotland. Scotland, darling. So she studied the craft with really some of the best distillers in the world. And I don't think she was 21 yet when she got back to the States and then started, finished her degree in marketing and then carried on the tradition so far of the Netheries and Jep the Creed. So in this episode, we chat about that. We also talk about, this is so cool, how they grow all of their own heirloom non-GMO corn. And the corn is called Bloody Butcher Corn. And that is what is used in their spirits, their vodka, for example. So yeah, they grow it on their farm. Uh, We dig into the corn aspect a lot and the farming part, which is so interesting. I mean, it's obvious when you listen to this episode with Joyce and Autumn, they're so so into farming and the love they have for the land of their ancestors. And we chat a little bit about the history of the land, which is so cool. Um, We're talking Daniel Boone times. (laughs) Oh, did I mention their vodka was just named the official vodka of the Kentucky Derby? So awesome. So congratulations to Jephtha Creed for that. Uh, We also talk about the distillation process. We geek out a little bit here. Um, We talk about how they chose and hurdled some just tough decisions um, when they were doing the physical layout of the distillery. Super interesting. Um, I really love this episode, this story, and I'm excited to share this with you all. So please enjoy this episode with... Joyce and Autumn Nethery. (laughs) 
Okay, it's November 2015. The groundbreaking day, literally. For this day is when this mom-daughter dynamic duo broke ground on the 15,000 square foot distillery on the family's 64 acre property in Shelbyville, Kentucky. Now, if you're thinking Kentucky, you're probably thinking bourbon. And yes, whiskey, vodka, moonshine, my friends. So if that's the case, you are quite right. A distillery in the making, which is now fully, and I mean fully operational, and has created incredible buzz in the spirits world. Now, this epic tale is much much grander, and goes way deeper than just another Kentucky distillery. For this team, Mama Joyce and daughter Autumn, the Nethries, have a story that is truly incredible. For what they are creating is nothing less than inspirational and forking tasty. From their farming techniques, the family creed, their commitment to sustainability and heirloom varietals, to honoring the rich heritage of Kentucky and Scotland, Joyce and Autumn hold true to Nuble, which you're going to have to help me out if I said that wrong, Adam. <laughs> say That's it again. Can you say it? Nuble. 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 Okay. So and yeah. they hold true to Nuble. So do not forget. <laughs> and I am honored to have these two incredible women with us today. And we're about to embark on the Jephthah Creed story. Welcome, Autumn. And I think Joyce is going to be joining us in a few minutes. Is that, is that true? Yes. Yeah. She'll be joining us here in just a couple of minutes. Okay. So welcome, Autumn. Thank you so much for joining. Oh, no problem. Thank you so much for having us. <laughs> I'm, I'm very excited about this. Yeah, me too. Sweet. So I know that um, every episode we start off with a toast, a little chin mm-hmm. chin, a little salute. So what I'm going to do <laughs> is raise my glass and tell you what I'm toasting with. And I'll have you raise your glass and tell us what you're toasting with. And then I'll have you do the honors of the toast. Okay. So I, I'm raising my glass to you and Joyce when she comes. <laughs> and <Yes>. I have, <laughs> and in spirit, you know, I'm on the boat in Marina Del Rey. And it's usually, I usually have a little white wine, you know, at this hour, but today I went with a little red. I have a little uh, Cabernet Sauvignon decoy, just a little sip to give it a little kickoff to the podcast. So I raise my glass. All right. Well, I raise my glass. And right now I've got our six month whiskey, the Bloody Butcher's Creed, it's the third batch. So I've got a little of that in my, my glass here. Uh, right now, all I have in my office is a coffee mug. So that is what I'm toasting with. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> yeah. uh, so yeah, I'm very toast. excited. Uh, thank you guys so much. And Neuble, do not forget. Ah, cheers. Cheers, Neuble. 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 I'm going to take a sip. So hold, please. <laughs> mm. All right. Ah, delicious. I'm excited to come to Kentucky and taste some of that bourbon when it's when it's ready. Is it, is it ready oh, yet? 2019 um, or eight? Bourbon is going to be coming in 2019. Oh my gosh. So Got to let it age a little bit in those barrel barns there, but I'm very excited about it. I mean, like the six month whiskey that I just toasted with, um, it is fantastic for being so young and I cannot wait to try what our bourbon's going to taste like in 2019 right oh before gosh. we release it. That's I'm cool. So, so excited cool. about it. I can't imagine I the flavors that it's going to oh, pick so up. Cool. So I'm we're so definitely going to get into... I want distilling and then the, your, you know, your secret recipe with the what, the corn that you grow. It's not so secret, but it's it's delicious. <laughs> and why you use I that. I like the idea of it being kind of secret. It is kind <laughs> of secret. Not a lot of people do that. No, so. I, th- I, I was researching that and there's not actually a lot of people at all doing that. And you also have the heirloom seeds too that you yeah. uh, continue are able to continue with, which is awesome. So let's start with this. What, what, um, and I hope I pull out some of your Southern drawl in there. Um, I, I think I heard it for a second. <laughs> uh, yeah. I, I'm one of those that my accent kind of comes and goes depending on who I'm talking with. So. <laughs> right. Okay. So, so Autumn, tell, tell us a little bit, what was it like growing up at the Nethery dinner table? Oh, well, at the Nethery dinner table, my family's always been entrepreneurial in their spirit. Uh, so growing up, remember all of those those farming aspects before we kind of, my dad took off and did his entrepreneurial thing where he started his own businesses and he was extremely successful with them. And he decided that he wanted to start a distillery. And some background on my mother, she worked in industrial distillation uh, when I was very young. She did that for 10 years. She is a chemical engineer by trade. And 
when he brought it up to her, she looked at him like he was insane. <laughs> <laughs> she has worked with six foot stills before and she was like, what makes you think we can do this? Yeah. Um, but she, he bothered her enough about it <laughs> <laughs> that she decided that he was going to need some training. So she found Moonshine University in Louisville. And it was the very first class they had ever done, turns out, of this six-day distiller course. When, when was that? Sorry, Autumn. When, when was that? What, what? That was in 2013. Okay. That was when she signed, up, signed him up for that class. Okay. It was January of 2013. In fact, I remember this. But she got him signed up. And like a couple of days before the class was supposed to get, begin... He had an obligation with his other company where he had to go out of state. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> so he couldn't go. So he sent my mother to the class and she fell back in love with her chemical engineering. She fell back in love with the copper, was felt totally in place there and could see where we can marry his agricultural background with her chemical engineering to come up with Jeff the Creed, even though at the time we didn't have a name for it yet. Wow. And uh, when they brought this up to me, I was underage. Right. When you say underage, because you're so, I mean, you're, you're so young I right am. now. You're, I'm 23. Yeah, you're 23. Right now. So um, that was so, obviously, you know, you were 20. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> at the time when they brought this up, I was 19. Yeah. Uh, freshman year of college, just trying to figure out what I wanted to do with myself and um, what I wanted to do with my life. They brought this up and I was like, okay, it sounds interesting, but I know nothing about it. So during my spring break, being blessed as I am to live in Kentucky, the bourbon capital of the world, I live 45 minutes away from all of the major bourbon distillers in the world. <laughs> <laughs> right. And they all do tours, which is fantastic. <laughs> and so they took me around. They took me to all of them. And I remember we were at this one distillery and they found out that I was kind of interested in going into the field. And they did like a big behind the scenes tour. They went into all the nitty gritty. Oh, that's awesome. And I just fell in love with the art of distilling. And I knew that this is what I wanted to do with the rest of my life. And then you... That was when I found the program in Scotland. Right. You went to Scotland for a year, <laughs> didn't so you? I went to, went to Scotland. Yeah. I was in Scotland for a year in Edinburgh studying brewing and distilling. Because at wow. the time in America, there were no programs that allowed people under 21 and... Even then, Kentucky, University of Kentucky, uh, Western Kentucky University, all of them didn't have these distilling programs like they have now. So I went overseas. <laughs> what do you think? Of, well, how do you think about... I mean, that probably, in hindsight, was probably a, a blessing or a beautiful thing because it is pretty unique. And it is... It is you, you, you went to the source, you know, right? You're going to... Yeah. You went, you went over there to learn... Yeah, I went to where it all started. Yeah. Where whiskey distilling all started. <laughs> wow. And so then you came back... And you finished up. You finished up with your marketing degree. I think you have a marketing degree at University of Kentucky. Yes, that is where I finished up my marketing degree. Uh, when I came back, we were just getting ready to start construction, and I still had about a year and a half left on my degree. So I transferred to UK, which was only about forty-five minutes from my house, and uh, I was able to finish up my degree while simultaneously building the distillery and getting all of our marketing up and running. <laughs> and it is not a small distillery. Um, no, I mean, we're, like, we're relatively, as, as far as footprint goes, we are a very big craft distillery. Yes, 15,000 yeah. square feet. Not a lot of craft distilleries have that much space. Yeah, and I'm very beautiful. happy that we have that space. It's beautiful. I've seen the pictures. <laughs> I mean, it's, it really is beautiful. Um, so, Jep the Creed, you have, um, I love the story of um, A, how you came to the name of Jep the Creed. I think your your mom was, uh, your mom's Joyce. She, she was a I think she tells a, a great story when I was looking at some research. Um, yeah. There's the Jep, the, the name, and then there's like this, there's cre the creed that you all kind of, the mantra, your foundation for what you've built Jep the Creed on. You want to yeah, tell us a little bit about that? I will. And my mother, Joyce, just joined us. So oh, hello, just Joyce. back from her last meeting. Hi, <laughs> how are you? I'm great. Thank you so much for joining and welcome. Well, thank you. I'm very, I'm very much happy to be here. Excellent. You, we've only got started a couple minutes ago, and I, I did have the opportunity to uh, Skype uh, visual as well with um, Autumn. So maybe afterwards we can zoom in so we can at least say hi. <laughs> okay. <to> okay. <laughs> Excellent. So yeah, so we were just talking about um, Autumn's background and a little bit of the trajectory. And 
Uh, and then my question is about Jephtha Creed and, you know, what, what Jephtha, where the name came from and, and this mantra, Jephtha Creed, the foundation for what you've built upon. Yes, yes. I, I like to think of Jephtha Creed as a value statement. You know, a lot of bourbons are named for people or for places, but I, I think of Jephtha Creed as a value statement. And we are very much into honoring our history and heritage and culture and ancestry. And really, you know, respecting our elders is a, a value that we hold pretty dear. So um, as we were trying to figure out what we were going to name our distillery, we learned that um, our home farm sits at the foothills of some hills here in Kentucky called the Jephtha Knobs. And we learned that those knobs were named by Squire Boone and Daniel Boone, who were explorers that explored this area in the late 1700s. And they named them Jephtha after a biblical warrior in Judges 11. So I have my own personal history right there. We have a lot of local and state history wrapped up in the boons. And I have Bible history. <laughs> I'm like, what more could I ask for in a name? We've got to be Jephtha. And then creed is our promise to stand by honoring uh, our value of respecting our elders and, and honoring our culture. Yeah, I love that. And then I think you have a great story, Joyce, as well, when you were talking about, I mean, you know, trying to manifest this and is this right um, moving forward doing a distillery? I mean, it's not a small, that wasn't a small little chew. I mean, you had to go in all to, in order to move forward with with this distillery. And I think that it was, I was, I'm just curious, you, you were in an interview or you were writing, wrote somewhere about how you, um, you were looking for signs, you know, you asked the universe, whatever you want to call it on a, you know, on a retail level, God, spirit, you know, what, uh, universe, but you were looking for, you were asking questions like, is this how I want to move forward? Like, is this going to, in the best interest? And you said you kind yes. of like got, had some signs and I'm really curious, was there, was it more of a feeling of signs or was it like visual signs or I don't know if you can expand on that a little bit, if you're comfortable with that, it might be a strange question. Yeah, no, I understand. And it's, 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 really kind of foundational to me. It was very important that I felt like um, God, this was a direction that God wanted my family to go in. And he never spoke to me directly. You know, I didn't get any visions or anything like that. But I, I did wrap this whole this whole um, approach for our family in prayer. And there were, you know, several prayers that got answered. One of them is the program that Autumn went to, that Harriet Watt Distillery in um, Edinburgh. Um, that's a pretty exclusive and very small program. I think there's what thirty students that are admitted a year. Wow. Yeah, the year that I the year that I was there, uh, there were only fifteen first years. Wow, yeah, there were 15, that's amazing, Autumn. Yeah, admitted. So, um, you know, in a whole world full of people who want to go into brewing and distilling, and there's only fifteen openings. I'm like that. If she gets in, that's mm -hmm. going to be an answered prayer. So that is actually one of one of the signs that I. Yeah. that I took as a sign that this was the direction for us to go in. Yeah, that's incredible. Because, you know, and sometimes for it's helpful for people when they're trying to make decisions or and what's it based on. And, you know, you, there's a gut feeling. And then there's like, you know, you turn it over and be like, okay, show, you know, somebody, you know, look for the signs of being open. So I was just curious because I feel like it's important for people to understand, um, you know, moving forward in a direction that's so you know, big, <laughs> this was a big, yeah. this was a big move. <laughs> yes, it, it, it really, it truly was. And, you know, I, I think there's three parts of the, of, uh, of what we're doing. You know, there's the whole agricultural part yeah. of growing the corn. And then there's the second part of the production part of actually um, producing it. And then the third part is the uh, selling, you know, the retail side of it. And, you know, as we were looking at this business, we had the agricultural piece and we had the, the engineering and production piece down pat. I mean, I felt 100% comfort level, you know, that we were going to be able to do those pieces. And then there's the, uh, the selling piece. And, um, you know, that's a pretty significant piece. And mm -hmm. at first, on the first blush, it's like, well, we didn't have a whole lot of experience there. <laughs> right. But... Um, we, I think we're covering that that part very well too. And um, it's all coming together really, really well. Yeah. And then you have, I mean, it's kind of a trifecta, right? You have your husband, which is the with farming fa in the family. Yes, with the we, agricultural piece. Yep. And then we have, we you, have you with the... Um, um, me with master, the engineering piece. Yeah. The master, your master in chemical engineering. 
Masters, I think it was. And then with uh, Autumn, we have her as a marketing. So you have the farming side, you have the uh, distill, the engineering side, and then we have Autumn with the marketing side. Yes. yes. So uh. you called it a trifecta, and I think that's a beautiful word to to use to apply to us. That uh, Autumn's coming up, up and coming with the the whole marketing piece. So it's yeah. uh, all of it's coming together. So I want to get into the products and the in the ag side of everything too, because it's really really cool what you how you are curating the ingredients. I just, I love that story. But let's, let's give a paint a picture for people that might not have seen, you know, the pictures of the, of Jep the Cree Jet. What, give us the physical of the distillery because you have it broken down into the different arenas or the different parts of the property itself. Yeah. Uh, so the distillery from the, an aerial view, it kind of looks like an H in a way. So as you're first coming down the interstate, going from Louisville to Lexington, the first thing you're going to see when you get to our exit is this big, beautiful, red, almost barn-looking building. Uh, when we were constructing, a lot of people thought it was like church. Oh, really? Uh, my <laughs> response to them is, we're not a church, but we do have spirits. So <laughs> That's smart. Maybe there might be something there. Uh, <laughs> But the building, it's got a lot of wood. We've got antique cars all throughout the property. Uh, the first thing when you come in, when you're walking into the building, is our retail building, uh, our retail side of it. So the gift shop, uh, our craft bar, which has the stone wall in the back, which I'm so excited about because that was my idea. Oh, really? I, awesome. I feel like it went well. So yeah, I kind I of it. pat myself bravo, on the back for that bravo. one. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but lots of wood, it almost kind of... When people walk in, they almost kind of feel like they're in a like a really nice ski lodge, mm. <laughs> like Aspen kind of ski lodge, you know, with like all the wood and the timber frames. And yeah. you just, we wanted it to feel very homey. We wanted people to come in and feel like they could just, they were at a place where they could relax, kick back, enjoy some time with family and friends. And we really just wanted them to feel comfortable. So from there, we've also got the back patio, which is gorgeous. So despite being right on the interstate, you get into that back patio, you look out into the woods. Uh, if the tree leaves are, or it's like fall and there's no leaves on the trees, you can see our barrel barns where our bourbon is aging. Oh, that's but really cool. You don't hear any kind of audio from the interstate oh, nice. whatsoever. It is just so peaceful. You feel like you're in just such a rural area when less than 100 yards away is a major thoroughfare in Kentucky. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. And then from there, the middle portion where we've got these gigantic windows that face out to the interstate so you can see our copper stills as you're driving by is the still room. That is the production area. That is where we make all of our products. So oh. they are cooked there, they're fermented there, they're still there, and we bottle in there. Wow. Um, so everything of that process Distill distillation wise gets done in that room. And then the last third of the building is our warehouse and office space. So it's all the boring stuff. <laughs> <laughs> it's all the admin stuff. Yeah, but you get to be around all the barrels probably, right? You said your your warehouse, is that like where you get to just... That's not where... The, the only time that we have barrels in here are when they're empty and we just got them in and we're getting ready to fill them up or they just got filled that day and they're getting ready to go out to the barrel barns. All of our bourbon aging takes place in our... or I call them barrel barns because they're modeled after tobacco barns, mm. but they're our bourbon warehouses, our brick houses cool. that we have here on site that we've built. And right now we have two. Uh, by the end of this year, we'll probably have our third wow. since we've already got the first one almost filled up and the second one's pretty... Not halfway getting, full. Get, already yeah. halfway full. Wow. And, um, that's, in, that's incredible. So. And then... And then when you were talking about with the distillation, you were talking about the copper. Um, is there yes. different? Is there different with the stills? Are there different? So, so we can educate us, the listeners, a little bit, or the fans of <laughs> of bourbon. How? What exactly? Mm, there's a Isn't there like a continuous still? And then there, there's different uh, names of these. Yes. Process. There are. Yeah. We we help have. Me out, thanks. <laughs> we have three different stills. We have. Th Three product lines. We have the obviously the bourbon. We're making bourbon. We're totally excited to, to have our bourbon. And we also have a vodka line and a moonshine line. And we have three stills. We have a 12-inch diameter continuous column. This column is about almost 30 feet tall. 
and has a lot of different trays in it. So that um, that's where we distill our bourbon and what we call the low wines of our vodka. And that still can get our product up to around one, between 130 and 160 proof, which is exactly where you want bourbon to come off at. Okay. Okay. So that's, our, that's how we produce our bourbon. For our vodkas, we go through that still also. But for vodka, you have to distill up to at least 190 proof. And that continuous column just can't get it all the way up there. So uh, that intermediate step, we call it the, the vodka low wines. We put that vodka low wines back into another batch continuous system that also is a, a column. And we distill that up to 190 proof on a secondary column. We call it our vodka still. Oh. And that's where we get our vodka product. Then we have a third setup. It's a hybrid pot still. And what that hybrid part means is we have four trays, four bubble cap trays on that still. And that's where we make our moonshine. And as part of that still, we also have a thumper system on it so that we can make, you know, official vodka. I mean, uh, uh, moonshine moonshine has to, you know, through the the backwoods always went through a thumper. So we wanted a thumper on our our What's a system. thumper? Cuz I've watched that show Moonshine. Uh, there was some I on the Discovery Channel. I think I love that show because I found it to be so cuz I'm obsessed with like the moonshine and the distilling and the and everything. I'm so intrigued by it. So what is a thumper? So the thumper is uh, like on the, the Moonshiner show is a uh, a a tank in between the actual um pot where the mash is being heated up. And turned into a vapor. And then to clean it up a little bit more, you take that vapor and take it through a liquid in the thumper. And the, as that vapor is hitting that liquid, that liquid expands and, and causes this thumping sound. And that's where it gets its name. And that's where it gets a thumper. Okay. Okay. <laughs> it's literally a thumper. It literally thumps. Oh, okay. And, and then, you know, the vapor get, then gets condensed and it's moonshine. And so, moonshine, is it a higher proof? Or is it the way it's probably, what makes a moonshine a moonshine? Well, for us, moonshine is, because moonshine is not a legal term. It's, um, you know, the, what you call the backwoods product that's illegal product, but we make it legally. Right. Yes. To me, the moonshine is significant. We call it moonshine because that's what we consider to be our rebellious, independent spirit. spirit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I get it. Yeah. It's the so, same, you know, yeah. It's, it's a spirit that's going to, do its own thing, its own way. Yeah. And uh, that's why we, we call it the moonshine. Um, our moonshine is actually a clear, uh, unaged whiskey. So we make our moonshine from grains, from scratch. So it's actually a whiskey. So because so from the whiskey, is that from the your whiskey mash, which is the corn? Yes. So our moonshine is made from corn. It is also made from malted rye and malted wheat and malted barley. So we make ours from grain. A lot of moonshines, uh, if it gets made from, uh, you know, made by hand, it's made with sugar and they call it sugar shine. That's not exactly, that's not what we've done. We've made ours from grain. So ours is actually a whiskey. Wow. So, so like Autumn, when you went to, when you were at, um, was it called, I'm sorry, Harriet Watt, did Do they, is it the basic understanding, the scientific side of distillation process, and then you kind of go back and play with the, not play, but, you know, figure it it out? Or do you, are you actually like, because you have to age, it takes the process. I mean, how do do you get taught that process in a year? I mean, you had to learn a lot, I'm sure. (laughs) Yeah, there was a, there was a lot that needed to be learned. Yes. Uh, When it comes to the maturation side of it, really the only way you're going to learn it is getting out in the field and experimenting with it with yourself. Um, Now, as far as like our thesis and that kind of stuff went, like I I knew one person where they, theirs was rapid aging where they took the barrel and they used like a five gallon barrel and they put it on this rotary system so that it was always constantly turning. Mm. And their theory was that because it was always turning, we had a a glass still and a small copper still that we got to work on and learn some of the processes as well. 
It was a lot of scientific theories and the reasons why these alcohols and these sugars get converted and make the product that we end with. And it was very scotch heavy yeah. <laughs> for obvious reasons. Yeah. <laughs> uh, since it was, you know, the home of the Scotch Whiskey Institute. Right. But it was a very good program. I learned a lot. Yeah. And there's just some things that being here in a still room and working with a still with your own two hands that you just can't learn from a textbook. Right. No, that makes that makes sense. And then you have you also have your you know, your joys to help too with some of the more... Yes. Pra- yes. yes. You've, you've practiced a little bit there with your history. So you know a little bit how some things work. Or was it trial and error? I mean, to come up with your recipes. I mean, in 2015 is when you break, break ground. 2016, I think, is when you uh, open the doors perhaps. And now we're in 2018, mm-hmm. the very beginning. So, I mean, I'm just trying to imagine this whole process. It, it seems like it went kind of fast over the past few years. I mean, to build build this amazing um, distillery, the process. I mean, even just the HVAC, right? You didn't want the certain piping showing and then you're trying to figure out the <laughs> cooling system. I mean, there's a huge process that you had to go through. And- yes, <laughs> it's been quite a challenge. We've been on a, a giant marathon for the past couple of years, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah, to say the least. I mean, just, I mean, I, you know, I mean, there's just such a, every, and then you have food too, the food side. I think you even chose to write. You have offer some type of uh, yes. Snacks we have and a lunch. soup, salad, and and sandwich luncheon menu that we do. Yeah, I mean that's um, so just to throw in even more. But I guess you want to have food too at your at your um, the story so people can um, taste. Yeah, without... Sit down, enjoy, and you know have uh, have some food to enjoy your cocktails with is really what our our thought process was, so that people can stay and enjoy the ambiance a little bit longer. And then you have this. It's like there's a a description called the craft farm distillery. So yes, you can. So can you talk a little bit about that? Because I love, see, I'm super into the gardening side and the farming side. And I just love um, how you can go, you know, literally, what was it from like farm to glass or you, know, you literally are harvesting on your yes. farm, your ingredients. And then we can maybe get into a little bit about the, um, the their corn that you use. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the kind of the, the sustainable gardening, sustainable practices that we use came about because before this, I was doing some gardening, you know, uh, anyway, um, I was using some organic techniques, but, uh, you know, we're not going to be certified organic, but using sustainable techniques. And that really came about because I wanted a good tasting tomato. Yeah, it came down to the tomatoes, right? You were like, it tastes like cardboard, I think you said, or something, which I agree, right? Exactly. It all started with the tomato. Once you have a good tomato. Once we get here, it tastes like cardboard, you know, wet cardboard. So I started a, a garden and I used the uh, hybrid um, varietals that grow so well and, and, and look so beautiful and uh, got my harvest and got the tomatoes and I was kind of disappointed because for all that work, they didn't taste that much better than what I was getting at the grocery store. So then uh, the next year, I decided I would try the heirloom varietals of tomatoes and um, I planted those. The plants went everywhere because they're indeterminate, so they keep growing and growing and growing. So they're, they're messy, messy plants. And then some of the tomatoes themselves looked kind of weird, kind yeah. of, you know, yeah. funky sometimes. Right, right. <laughs> but then I ate them, and I was like, oh, thank goodness. This is what I was wanting. This is a good-tasting, old-fashioned tomato that I was, you know, longing for. So the next year, I thought, well, if heirloom varietals made a difference for tomatoes, maybe it's going to make a difference for squash and watermelon and all these other different um, vegetable varieties. So I planted a lot of heirloom varietals of all those different vegetables, and it truly did make a difference. Yeah. They were, the, the heirloom varietals just tasted so good. They all had issues, but they tasted so good. <laughs> So issues like, growing, you mean? Like some of the, with the, first, you know, the... Yeah, issues growing, yeah. you know, you get less uh, disease resistant, so they get some of the fungal diseases yeah. a little bit worse, you know. So um, you have to take more care, I think, of the heirloom varietals. I feel like you have to look at them every day, like, and make sure you have to really look, like, at the leaves, at the soil, at the stems to see what their health yes. is. Yes, yes. Yeah, and, and I also found out that bugs 
like the heirloom varietals better too. <laughs> so I kind of came to the real, uh, realization, well, you know what, if the bugs, if the bugs like them better, <laughs> I like them better too. <laughs> <laughs> right? No, it's true. <laughs> yeah, right. that's, oh, no, so I was, I was just thinking about the, um, the corn, because you have a funny story about the corn too. With the yes. <laughs> so then we got to the corn, and um, yeah, I've been doing the sustainable gardening thing. So like when we came to this decision that we we're going to do this, I was like, well, we need heirloom corn, and I've I've seen this varietal called Bloody Butcher. Let's try that. And we grew about twenty acres of the Bloody Butcher corn in a field that was separated by some trees with a, another field that we planted of non-GMO yellow and. Prior to doing the distillery, our home farms had pretty much become food plots for deers and turkeys because our mission was to grow really large antlered deer. Oh, okay. <laughs> and so we watched the deer and the turkey. <laughs> and as we were growing this bloody butcher corn, we would watch the deer walk through our yellow corn to get to the bloody butcher field to eat. Mm. And they would eat it and eat it and eat it. <laughs> <laughs> so again, like the books, like the, the deer, they had a choice yeah. and the deer chose the bloody butcher. That's I awesome. want to choose it too. Yeah. No, it's awesome. I love that story. Yeah. Yeah. So we, um, and really kind of the next thing that we did is we took what they left us and harvested it and ground it and took it to a distillery in Wisconsin and distilled it because one of my things was I wasn't going to make this investment in this distillery if this bloody butcher corn didn't make an excellent bourbon. Right. So I had to test that out. And we did. And we went to Wisconsin and did four batches. We did the bloody butcher corn with um, wheat. We did the bloody butcher corn with rye. And then we did the wheat and the rye with the yellow corn as as controls. And as we distilled it, immediately coming off the still you could tell a difference between the bloody butcher and the yellow corn. And it just really? tasted so much smoother yeah. and so much um, nicer and a little bit sweeter. And there was a little bit of nuttiness to it. And I was just like, oh, this is so good. Oh, nice. That's so good. <laughs> so that's so interesting because I honestly, I never heard of bloody butcher. I mean, I know visually now what it looks like after researching, but I never heard of the you know bloody butcher corn, let alone... Um, you know, the yeah, it being used in bourbon and, and the reasons why. So, you know, thank you. Because <laughs> it, it broadened my my horizon. And it's funny, it's named, it goes back, I said, like from mid-1800s, I think, the history. Can you tell us a little bit about this bloody butcher corn historical trajectory or where it's sourced? Well, from what we can tell, um, it has been growing in this area since the uh, mid-1800s. We've seen documentation that says it's been growing since, as it is, since 1845. Um, the, the theory goes, nobody knows exactly where it originated, but the theory goes that it was a combination of white settlers' corn and Indian corn mm. and uh, combined to make the Bloody Butcher. And the story goes that it got its name, Bloody Butcher, from because it's actually when it, the corn's in the corn and the cob eating stage, that milk stage, it's actually white. Mm. And it turns red as it dries on the stalk. And at some of the some points, if you look at it in between corn on the cob and totally dry, it's kind of splotched. And the theory goes that they got its name, Bloody Butcher, because if you look at it during that time period, it, it looks like butcher's apron okay yes <laughs> that's how i got the name bloody butcher that's interesting so did so autumn did you are you into the farming side as well i mean you grew up obviously your parents both are farming and the dairy i think you said your dad's side was the dairy dairy cows um are you into the farming side or is that something that um is not as much interest for you or is it just kind of you know laissez-faire no, I'm into the farming side. Believe me, harvest season comes around and it's all hands on deck. <laughs> it takes everybody. Yeah. You also have pigs. Yeah, and, and I've got pigs too. Okay. Um, so I live on the farm still, but I live on the opposite side of the farm now. Our farm's kind of long and I want to say lean, but it's longer <laughs> than it is Wider. Um, wide. Mm. So they live on the top 
part and I live on the back side. Okay. <laughs> I mean, you grew up as are the fields. That's awesome. So but, you grew up with basically the farm, this farm life. I mean, just it's like this yes. epic tale when you think like, okay, growing up, you're on this farm, you know, and then you, you go over to Scotland and you study distillation because <laughs> you decide you want it, and then you come back and, you, you know, you open up this amazing distillery and you're getting tons of accolades. So... It's just, it's just a, it seems like it's such a great environment that you've grown up on. And I was just wondering when you were, you know, having to take care of the land, if that's something, you know, when you're a kid, some people either like fall in love with it still, or they're just, they want to move away from it. So I was just wondering where you kind of stood on that. <laughs> yeah, no, when I first was graduating high school, I thought, oh, I'm going to leave. I'm going to go see the world. I'm going to go do my own thing. And in that process, I found that Kentucky and being on the farm really is my home and it will always be my home. And mm. while wow, there's nothing quite like it. That's amazing. So I'm I'm still there. Yeah. <laughs> I, I love that. And that was not I mean I, that's part I of moved the <laughs> like a little bit away. I could walk to my parents' house if I really needed to. So <laughs> <Let's see. laughs> I didn't really move all that far. But, and I'm still still farming. Like like my mother said, I do have pigs and so the slop from the mash uh, at the end of distillation process, we put it in our slop truck and haul it over to my pigs. They they love seeing that truck. Uh, I've got some very very happy pigs. <laughs> so so it's a whole it's a whole closed loop system in a sense. Is that you mean? So yeah. you have the so it is. Few... We are very sustainable, and the um, byproduct from that process will then go back and we'll either use it as a fertilizer for the corn fields for the next harvest, or it will get fed to our farm animals. So we're, it's a very sustainable process. I'm wondering about, I don't know, I was reading a little bit and this I found to be really interesting is that there's about 100, say, in 20 counties in Kentucky. And mm -hmm. there's the difference between, um, I was reading about wet, dry, and moist. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I don't know if that's something to talk about, but I, I found it to be interesting that there's, there's certain counties are um, where you can't have alcohol. Is that is that true or was that an older article that I read? Not necessarily your no, county, but... No, no, that's no, true. no, no, that's true. That's true. <laughs> so, In fact, yeah. it's just this past year that about 20 counties have, have voted to go um, fully wet. And Shelby County that we are is in is actually one of them. Okay, cool. Because the county we're in to build the distillery, uh, that was a fun thing. Uh, they spent six months trying to find a location for the distillery because at the time, we didn't want it on our home farms because we were... with within county limits. And they were, at the time, didn't allow distilleries at all or any kind of alcohol in the county. Mm -hmm. And um, so we were trying to find a good place to put the distillery. And after six months of searching, the very first location we even looked at, which is where we put the distillery, is the one we picked. Um, while it was in the county, it was right next to the border of the city of Shelbyville. So we could get annexed into the city of Shelbyville, which was wet, um, so that we could build the distillery and have a tasting room. Wow. Uh, so we did that. And <laughs> the month that we opened our doors, the county voted to go wet. <laughs> oh my gosh, really? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Wow. The month we opened. Oh my gosh. So that is, that is And there yeah. are still dry counties in Kentucky. There are. And what's moist, just so people understand I because I, I was I it, it goes dry means yeah. no alcohol allowed right so maybe dry take means no alcohol allowed wet means that you can have liquor stores and uh, restaurants can have bars and uh, serve alcohol moist means that there are certain precincts and certain areas where you're allowed to have alcohol and serve alcohol and have liquor stores well, by the glass. Moist, by the glass. Moist means you can serve by the glass. If you have a restaurant that seats um, like over a hundred, like over a, seats a hundred, and that seventy-five percent of your revenue is made by food sales. This episode is brought to you today by Aura Organic. I chose this company because I love the products and this crew. They are young, cool, hip, a little bit quirky, definitely passionate people, and they're based out of San Diego. So Aura Organic, it's a sustainable, sustainable, plant-based organic supplement company, and I found them on Shark Tank. Yeah, I was intrigued, uh, so I 
started de- digging a little deeper and purchased their products and started using them. And now I want to share them all with you for a sweet deal. So some of the products that I've been really obsessed with right now over the past few couple few months now, one is called Trust Your Gut. So Trust Your Gut is a pre and probiotic. I really like the powder. I just mix it in the water. It dissolves really quickly and just take it right in the morning. And Trust Your Gut is... Um, you know, your gut's important. <laughs> it's your second brain. Um, mood, your mood is based upon, you know, what's going on in the microbiome. The microbiome is, uh, can be thrown out of balance, like stress, food, alcohol, oopsie, <laughs> exercise. So taking a probiotic daily is super, super important to maintain the balance in the microbiome. And the microbiome is, it's in your gut. And we can get into the details about that on, a, on another episode. But it's really important to keep your gut happy. Happy gut, happy person. <laughs> That's my mantra. Um, the second product that I've been using a lot lately is the Omega-3 spray. Yes. Instead of taking fish oil supplements, uh, which are great, you know, Omega-3 is really good for your brain, uh, for cognitive behavior, <laughs> if that's even a, a word. It's really good for your brain. It's really good for your hair. It's really good for your nails, your skin. So I believe that everybody should have some of these in your arsenal, in your daily routine, your rituals in the morning. Um, a lot of you have been uh, sending me feedback about the Easy Bean Green, which is the greens powder. People really love that. It's an organic alkaline green powder. Um, one scoop a day, boom, you're done. And again, everything's organic, USDA organic. The packaging is sexy. I freaking love this company and I'm excited to share with you aura.organic forward slash just forking around. Purchase as often as you want, any products that you want, and you will receive 15% off your entire order, not just one and done, when you use at checkout just forking around. So at checkout of the aura.organic website, just put in just forking around and you will receive a 15% discount off of their amazing products. Enjoy. I, I grew up in a town that was dry from, I'm from Boston area and the town that I grew up, I'm in Santa Monica, California now, but I grew up in Boston area and our town was quote dry. And I remember growing up, I didn't understand. So if we like that, what that, Entailed, but it was just really funny because all of the bordering towns, which was like a mile away, it wasn't a very big town. They all had, you know, the restaurants that did really well, the grocery stores that, you know, the liquor, we call them packies back then, but liquor stores. And it was just so interesting that that the little town I grew up in, you couldn't have alcohol because all of the other towns did and they weren't that yeah. far away. It just, you know. So you the, had to go to the other town to go get your, uh, yes. your beer. So the revenue was just, that's so interesting. I want to loop back though a little bit more towards with the corn because I feel like this is really interesting. I was reading a little bit about, about how, when you, how you grow this corn and the difference in actually growing it. There was like a whole process, I think, Joyce, that you were mentioning or, or maybe your, your farmer, I don't know if there was a gentleman there talking about some of the challenges, some of the, you know, differences in the regular corn, there's the height, there's the thickness, there's the susceptibility yes. to wind and the rain. So can you tell us a little bit about that? Because I love this, this corn story. Well, that's, that's one of the beautiful things about this bloody butcher corn is that the flavor is so fantastic, but actually trying to grow it is, you know, what that first year, you know, we said the animals attacked it and loved it. We found out that that's, one of the pieces that why it's not grown commercially because mm. the animals and wildlife absolutely love it. There's also some issues uh, with the bloody butcher corn separate from that. Um, it As you plant it and you grow it, it gets very, very tall. This past year was a fantastic year for growing corn and we measured up to 15 feet tall. 15 and for perspective, feet. Yeah. regular corn, like the corn you would get at the grocery store, gets to like a max of eight feet. Yeah. Okay, wow. So it's almost twice as tall yeah. as uh, commercial corn. And for as tall as it gets, the diameter of the stalk that's holding it up is pretty narrow. And um, it likes to, that doesn't like to fall, but it falls over pretty easily. So like when it starts to get the corn um, ears on it, uh, that, that makes the, the top 
kind of heavy because some of those ears can be up at 10, yeah. 10 feet. Like if you were going to pick it yourself, right. you, had, you yeah. need a step ladder mm-hmm. to pick those ears. So that makes it kind of top heavy and top in, in addition to being so tall. So that when there's an August thunderstorm, when those ears are on there, and there's always an August uh, yeah, thunderstorm. Yeah, at least right one. <laughs> <laughs> it, yes, at least right, one. At least one. It, it blows a lot of the corn over and it, fa- it literally falls over and falls onto the ground. Um, and that yeah. makes it hard to harvest, to have to pick those stalks up. And in addition to that, some of the some of the stalks can have two ears on on the stalk. And your your hybrid varietals that, that you eat from the grocery store right now mm, have one. right? So that they, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, it makes mm-hmm. it extra heavy. Um, so it gets very tall, a small diameter, likes to fall over. So it's hard to harvest. So it's hard to harvest because it falls over and it's hard to harvest because there is so much stalk on it. So it takes a lot of extra work for the combine to separate this this seed kernels that we want from all the the stock wow. pieces. That's that's I just think that was the whole part that's cool. And then there's other part there's other let's get into your products because I you know I'm like I have to go to Kentucky just to have Jeff the Creed because because <laughs> I I'm, like, I'm not kidding. <laughs> I'm not kidding. I'm like that. I'm serious. So I was looking at um Let's we can go through the, uh, the actual products that you have, and then I was lo- I was loving um, a lot of your fun drinks that you make. Um, I don't know if um, Autumn's mm-hmm. involved in that, but maybe we can go through some of your cool the cool cocktails that you make. And I was looking at some um, online; you had some cool videos of different um, seasonal, um, and I'm sure that those ingredients probably a lot of them are sourced from from your farm. So let's talk a little bit about your um, the yeah. actual names. I think you have a, of the moonshine of the vodka. And then of the bourbon. All right. Well, for our moonshine, we've currently got five products right now. We have our original moonshine, which is 80 proof. And we have our lemonade flavored moonshine, which all of our flavored moonshines are 60 proof. Uh, we have a blackberry, an apple pie, which and a favorite? cinnamon. Uh, my favorite, I'm not much of a sweet person. Um, and our blackberry and our apple pie are definitely on the sweeter side. While they're fantastic, and I think it's the best apple pie moonshine out there on the market, my favorite is the lemonade moonshine. Okay, and Joyce, do you have a favorite? That one's the one that I really like. That's kind of like yeah, asking I know. which I was my gonna children say, that must be hard, like or it must be like <laughs> what mood I'm in, right? <laughs> like, like, exactly. Yeah, I think it's a tough question to ask. That, that makes so, it difficult yeah. too, because like the original moonshine, I mm. love cooking with like it, drinking and cooking, um, or using it. In your... <laughs> yeah, like drinking and cooking. Like I made a glaze out of the original moonshine that I put on some chicken. Oh, really? And it was okay, fantastic. that's cool. That's really cool. Yeah, so I like okay, cooking with yeah. our products too. But like when the blackberry, it makes this fantastic sauce mm. that you can put on ice cream. Yeah. It's just they all have their own little yeah. niches that are really good. Um, like the cinnamon was good with eggnog. Is that Never a newer one, the that. cinnamon? <laughs> it is, yes. That is one that we just released nice. this fall. I love that. The apple pie was fantastic mm. with eggnog too. And the it bottling, was. the bottles. Now who did, I mean, just, I mean, your label, the bottles, the whole, I mean, that's a whole other genre as well. But I love the bottles that you use. You want the glass? Yeah, I really like our little mason jars that we use for our moonshine. Um, you can't really tell on the photo, but they have these little indents on the side that make it easier for you to hold it in your hand. So it may, one, it makes it easier to pour out of if you're doing a cocktail, but at the same time, it makes it easier if you're just wanting to do, you know, the the way you really drink moonshine where it's straight at the jar so you get that Kentucky ring. Oh, wait, what right is it? Wait, tell me. <laughs> <laughs> tell us. This is awesome. This is like the pro tip. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so our jars have these indents on the side. So as you're holding it, if you're just going to yeah. sip straight out, you've got a better grip on the jar. So it helps <laughs> if you had a couple, you know, you, you're still good. I love it. Um, but... As you're sipping, then you you know you've got a good hold on your bottle as you're yeah. getting that good Kentucky ring right there around your mouth I love and your it. nose. The Kentucky ring, the end bit from that. the jar. It's like, yeah, I love that. That's Kentucky awesome. Ring. And so, um, and vodka. I'm a I'm a vodka drinker. Um, um, and and bourbon, but your vodka. As I was looking, I know you have a honey, an apple, and a blueberry. The one that we just released here in the like the last week was our hot pepper vodka, and it is infused with three different kinds of peppers and garlic. 
and it is really spicy. <laughs> it is perfect for Bloody Marys. Um, that's really what it was. We did this infusion behind the bar with peppers for Bloody Mary specifically, and people were just clamoring for it. They wanted it at home. They wanted it to take home. So we made it into official product for them. And it is really spicy. It's it's one of those where you drink it. It's on our tours. We suggest it's the very last thing that they try if they're going to try it. Because you will have that flavor on your mouth <laughs> for a long time. I know. It sounds amazing. <laughs> the finish on it is really, really long. But yeah. it's fantastic for those That's people amazing. who love spice. I, I guess like all of a sudden I start craving a Bloody Mary as you were talking about that. I know. I'm just making it, <laughs> making it harder for you. Huh? <laughs> we just uh, are ready to announce something really exciting about okay. our vodkas. Yeah. So we are the official vodka for the Kentucky Derby what? Festival that this is year. Amazing. Yes. Oh my God. I got That's chills. So exciting. You said that. That is so cool. Ooh. Wow. Yeah. So our, our original vodka is made out of 100% bloody butcher corn. Mm-hmm. We just switched the mash bill up on that. So it's now 100% gluten free for people like me who are allergic to. That is so cool. Yeah. I didn't know. So, so okay, because vodka is usually made out of wheat or you know, it can be made out of uh, potatoes. But this potatoes, Pota- vodka right. can really be made out of anything. Right. It can be made so, out of any starch. Can, that's so cool. So now you're going to be the official. That's just, I don't even know what to say. It's like bravo. I mean, how does that, how does that, what do you even, how do you even <laughs> navigate that? I mean, that's big, you know, that's big. Well, I think Autumn and her marketing nice. got us that. Yeah, that's so, amazing. It's awesome. Quite, quite, quite an exciting thing for us. We are so yeah. and what, so. With what's this. the flavor profile difference when you say it's? Is it? Is there a taste difference when you are like saying you're hundred percent mash with the vodka from the you know rookie taste flavor profile? Would I be able to tell? Well, vodka is supposed to be all flavor, you know, no detectable flavor and or no detectable odors, but that doesn't mean it's flavorless or odorless. Um, I mean, we do distill it. I mean, it goes through a lot of distillation and we do chill filter it. Um, But there is still this beautiful, subtle hint of corn in it. Um, So like a buttered popcorn, a very, very subtle buttered buttered popcorn taste to it. And it's got this sweetness to it that you get from the corn, this almost vanilla cookie note that you get that you would not expect coming off of vodka, especially knowing that it got distilled to 95% wow, alcohol right. content. So when it gets distilled that high, it has to go that high, but that's not what I'm drinking when I drink vodka, right? Or No, when you're drinking, we've added water to it, RO water, which is purified water. Yeah, so it gets proofed down to bottle strength. And it gets proofed down to bottle strength using that. And our vodka are 80 proof. Okay, All of our right. vodkas are 80 and proof then, right now. And that's norm- That's a- that's the standard. Okay, that's yes, that's average. Okay. That's yes. standard. Wow. So what? When we what's, well now we have to come, bring into the to the bourbon because we uh, w- that's going to be available soon, like next year. And we're excited about yes. that. I want to talk about the bourbon because that's you know the straight bourbon yes, whiskey. This is it. A year you, know, out. you have a wheat <laughs> bourbon, a rye bourbon. You have a four grain bourbon. I think. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so we have three mash bills for bourbon. That are going to be our Jephthah Creed bourbon. Uh, we do have the high wheat mash bill. So that is 75% of our beautiful Bloody Butcher corn. It is 20% malted wheat and 5% malted barley. Then we have the uh, high rye mash bill, which is 75% of the blo- beautiful Bloody Butcher corn and 20% malted rye and 5% malted barley. So it's the same percentages as for the wheat, but it's rye instead. And then for the uh, four grain, it is 70% of our Bloody Butcher corn, 15% malted rye, 10% malted wheat, and 5% malted barley. So it's kind of this... uh, Fusion of the other two in a, in a so how does it go? Sort of how, what happens now? Take us through the process a little bit, um, just real briefly. Like you're, do you? I know I'm a little bit naive in distill distilling process of uh, alcohol. More I understand um, fermenting like with beer and with wine and the tasting of that process. Do you do you go in and taste the barrels? As it as is there a certain rhythm that you do? Is there a certain you know? Do you talk to the barrels? <laughs> do you play music to the barrels? <laughs> I mean, like, you know, like do you have a? Yeah. Let's start with. Do you taste as time goes on? 
And how often? And do you, like, um, with wine, you do, you know, uh, you batonage, you know, you, maybe you mix it up with, the, you stir it up with the, um, to get the sugars going. Is there any process like that or you just let it be? Well, once it's in the barrel, we do taste it every once in a while. Probably um, in our fit, we've got, we've been experimenting this year with uh, really four different sizes of barrels. We did a five gallon barrel. We did 10s, 15s, and the 53s. So for the smaller barrels, you need to taste through them more often. So we would be tasting through like the, the 10s every four months or so. Um, for the 53s, We'll really, we'll taste them about once a year um, at the moment, you know, just to let them age out for a while. So yes, we do, we go, do go through and and taste through those. And what we do is we really drill a hole into the side of the barrel (laughs) and let the gravity force some of it out into a a bottle. And then we plug that hole back up and then um, we'll bring those test bottles back up here to the distillery. We will add some water to proof it down to kind of get closer to what we anticipate the bottling um, proof would be and taste through those and see how they're maturing and coming into so is there like a bourbon. Is there something that you look for, Joyce? And, and same with Autumn, is there like a, a color, uh, acidity, a brightness, uh, how it feels on the palate? Or is there certain characteristics that you, that you are looking for? Yes, Mm -hmm. we're looking for all of those. With bourbon, you obviously want to be looking for the color. Um, You want that beautiful amber color. And we'll also be looking for the amount of um, the the barrel barrel notes that come into it, such as the vanillas and the caramels and, and those butterscotch flavors. Those come from the barrel a lot. What I'm really starting to look for now is some fruit notes. Um, our Bloody Butcher Corn gives us a uh, flavor component called isoamyl alcohol in our distillate that um, I'm anticipating in the barrel will go through some um, oxidation and esterification reactions to become an isoamyl acetate, which is a banana. Yeah, that's so cool. I'm really expecting our bourbons over this next year to really develop a lot of those. And is it, are you, is it must be interesting to, to note, to see with the different size barrels. Yes, it is. Because the smaller barrels, you get a lot of those oak components pretty quick. Um, And it can get over-oaked very quickly. And it can get over-oaked very quickly. So that's what we really kind of watch out for a lot with the smaller barrels. And it's kind of a trade-off because then you don't get some of the um, maturation uh, components from just the time uh, being able to sit in the barrel because you do have to take it out relatively young. When you... When... um, when when you choose the barrel, are they, I mean, that, that, that whole other process, I mean, you have to decide where you're going to get your, is they called Coopers? So is it the same? Is it Coopers? Yeah. yeah so it's just, figuring uh-huh. that out, right? I mean, that's another whole process as well, because that's going to be important and, and kind of dictates a little bit the sense of the flavor profile and the aging and the how, yes. how it's good. So those are secrets. We definitely want to, don't want to give those away. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no. But, you know, what the cooperages do, do with the barrel is pretty important because that's where the whole charring comes in. So the amount of char that where the, the inside of the barrel is literally burned and mm-hmm. that charring is how burned is it? So um, we wanted ours to be like a char three. So that is uh, a little bit heavier than middle. And um, I think that's going to give us a lot of the the barrel characteristics, the, the vanillas and caramels of the barrel, and will give us a lot of um, beautiful toasted notes too. So you get some toasted bread and some of those type of characteristics wow, in there. That's incredible. So um, that, I just that's have a real quick question. I know we're coming up on time, but what uh, what's your pro- what's your thought? I I was reading a little bit about these like techniques of speeding up the aging process. You know, like. How does that, is that, um, mm-hmm. A, does it work? I mean, is that even, um, how do I say, is it cheating? Well, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> well, it is per the definition and law right, of right. bourbon. I mean, if you want a straight bourbon, you have to age it in a, a new charred white oak barrel. And, you know, over the course of time, I think that that process has proven itself. Um, but even then, I think it still just, it takes some time in the barrel to, to get to the product that we want. Yeah, you can get a good product using some of those 
uh, techniques that have come out. It is possible to have a good product. But some of the characteristics that are just natural to bourbon that the everybody looks for, those yeah, those complex flavors that you you get from bourbon, you're just not going to be able to get with anything other than time right, in the sense. barrel. I mean, that really, I was wondering what, you were, what your thoughts were on that and if it feels, it must, I don't know if it was felt, it's, it's not even maybe the same genre. It's not even in the same, or it doesn't even kind of cross over into what you're doing. I mean, there's things you can do to force some of those reactions to happen outside of a barrel. Like I've, I've seen some studies on ultrasonic um, techniques and, you know, some electrolysis techniques and, and some of those things. And they can get you some of those components uh, like a bourbon that you can get pretty quick. But then it's kind of um, kind of like a two-instrument orchestra rather than a 20-instrument ah, orchestra. Right. And also, that's, ex- that's a great way to put it. And also, there was something that you said about, you know, the corn wants to tell their story. <laughs> and so, you know, like yeah. allowing that process and allowing that story to, to un- kind of unfold you know, is, is, a, is a great yeah. think, scenario too. So let's, let's do a couple things real fast. So I'm going to ask you guys a couple questions, you two, you two ladies, a couple questions before we wrap up about um, some of the things over the past few couple of years. Um, Maybe starting with, um, I'll start with Joyce. So now that you're two years, uh, I would say two years into the project uh, that you're opened, um, what's your top, I want to know your top two takeaways, whatever that comes to mind after you've been open for two years now, the distillery has been open. Oh, I think for me, I'm, I'm finally hitting the point where it's getting to be a whole lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it's it's gotten to be a whole lot of fun and... Um, I think it's a, a much better, great experience being part of this bourbon industry than I would have ever dreamed it to be. It's it's a, a it's a really nice industry that people get along and um, help each other out. I mean, it's there's a whole the whole competition piece there too, but everybody everybody wants everybody to do well, and I've really enjoyed this industry. Um, oh, so good, and what about that. I love that, and um, so glad you're having fun now. I invite everybody to to go and well, I'll have links, but some to all those, um, the little clips that you've had some interviews with and, you know, just watching like just the process of the vastness of, you know, building out what you, what you have done, your family. It's amazing. Um, so Autumn, what about you? What's your top, maybe, uh, one or two takeaways over the past couple of years from this project that's been opened? Um, one of my top things is that construction is always going to take longer <laughs> than you think it is. Okay. <laughs> Agreed. <laughs> Yeah, that's one of my big things. Um, and then the other one is that everybody has different taste profiles. There are flavors that I will pick up on that somebody else won't pick up on at all. And I think it's just so cool to see everybody's reactions to different spirits. And that's why we have so many different types of spirits, so many different products out there is because everybody has different tastes No two people have the same taste profiles as each other. And to me, seeing that is so cool. Seeing the different flavors people pull from our products to me is really cool. Like when we first released the Lemonade Moonshine, I never would have pictured that people thought it kind of tasted like a tequila. So I have people who don't like tequila drinks, don't like margaritas or anything. They will buy our moonshine and make their own uh, Kentucky (laughs) Rita's. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and things out of it. And I never would have thought that when we first uh, created so cool. the product. What about, um, Joyce, what are your greatest achievements that come to your mind just over the past couple of years? Top one or two? I think the distillery as a whole, you know, the whole construction, you know, that we got products out that we've been open, we've uh, did completed our first year you know this that whole piece is um quite quite an accomplishment and a success story for us and i'm very very excited about that and the second piece is um that i'm thrilled to be able to watch my daughter grow and mature and develop and um, exercise her her marketing skills uh, and develop our our marketing line for our products. It's it's really excited to see your your children yeah, grow. I love and that. And then so for you, Autumn, what do you think? Where do you feel you're gonna see 
this all weeding, and I know this is hard to go in the next two years. Like you, you've been now through this, you've seen from two years ago to now, and it seems like it's exponentially growing, you know, <laughs> it's compounding, it's going fast and bigger and faster yeah. and great accolades. Do you have an, any, can your imagination roll out and see where you think we're, you're going to be in a couple of years? Well, I know where I want to be in a couple of years. Uh, I, one of my goals is to get us into more states. So that's what I'm working on right now is expanding our reach because right now we're available in Kentucky and Indiana. Um, so I want to get us regionally. And if possible, I'd like to even get an international yeah. market in there somehow. Which like yeah, to I would love it here in California, please. <laughs> I know, I have to talk about that, how that's going to happen. I know that I don't know the legalities of all the pieces with like importing expert in states. I know that like wine is a lot, but I don't know about the spirit side. But yeah, we got to get into the restaurants because we, we know a lot of restaurant people out here <laughs> as well. <laughs> yes, this could be a great symbiotic relationship. <laughs> um, <laughs> so um, Joyce, one other piece. What, knowing what you know now, what piece of advice do you wish you were told two years ago? The one thing I wish I'd have done um, two years ago is before um, construction, I wish I'd put some more product, more bourbon in mm-hmm. barrels and had um, my bourbon ready to uh, go when I opened. Yeah, we did that experiment. And now I wish, looking back on it, that we didn't just do the four barrels that we did. I wish we'd done some more. (laughs) Isn't it so Uh, funny with aging? I mean, don't you get so like when I, when I feel like once one really looks at vintages and really the process and what goes into, you know, the time it takes before you get to enjoy the bounty. I mean, it makes it almost that's more coveted. Yes. I think Mm -hmm. the whole anticipation and having to wait for it is um, part of the draw and attraction of of bourbon and, and whiskeys, you know, that you you can't get it straight off the still. You you have to let it age and mature and and get all those characteristics from the barrel. Yeah. It, it is. is one of the beauties of it. All right. Well, and I just read something that congratulations on Indianapolis. I believe that you're uh, moving into that region. Is that yes? So congratulations yes. on that. Did you find a name? Yes. <laughs> yeah, that's Thank amazing. You. And I think there I was on your LinkedIn. And did you find an, you were looking for it? some uh, public input for um, a name of your, was it the blueberry, uh, was it the blueberry vodka lemonade? <laughs> Did you come up with one? Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. I've gotten some, I've gotten some great uh, okay. suggestions yet. Uh, we haven't settled in uh-huh. on just one of them, but uh, uh, my favorite at the moment yeah, is the Yeah, I like that racer. one with the cars because I think of the Indianapolis. Yeah. So I was trying to yes. come up with something. Yeah. I'll, yeah. I'll email you if I come up with anything. I think maybe in the middle of the night I'll pop up because I, I was, I was, I was like <laughs> trying to mastermind something. I was going to come up with something extremely brilliant for the show, but it, you know, I'm going to have to probably email it to you, and or maybe I'll think of something and we can just like drop that, drop that in. <laughs> That's fun. <laughs> well, I love it. <laughs> okay, and then, and then, and then also there uh, just to close out. I was looking um, one other podcast you really love, of course, aside from just forking around, is um, Mike Rose. Um, the way I heard it is that I love that podcast yes. as well. Yeah, I think Rob Mike Rose is great. Yeah, I love what brilliant. he does. And um, there was one of the Mod Farmer. I think it was something that you read, and I I read that as well. I was trying to find some some parallels there. Yes, awesome. a grit grit magazine too. Modern yeah. Farmer Grit. Excellent. I love those. All right. Well, I am so I'm so thrilled for both of you and for Jephtha, and I'm excited. I am going to come and visit. I have been thinking about coming to Kentucky, and I really it's it's going to happen. It's definitely going to happen. Oh, we would love, to, love have you out. to have you here. Yeah, just let me know anytime that you're coming right. into Kentucky so and we'll much. make it happen. Okay, ladies, thank you again. And I, um, I'm i excited for uh, the uh, the future, definitely. Congrats. Well, thank you very thank much. You. We really appreciate you. And uh, we'd love to have all of your listeners come out here and, and visit with us. It'd be awesome. Absolutely. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks. Hey, everybody. I hope you enjoyed listening to that episode. And again, please rate and review if you did like this podcast episode or any of the other ones. Please go to iTunes, download, rate, review. I appreciate that very much. Just Forking Around Podcast. And again, I am Debbie Salzberg. My handle on Instagram is at Forking Podcast. My website is justforkingaround.net. 
And I am so excited to have you on board here with me on the Just Forking Around podcast. And I look forward to seeing you on the next show.